Hey, Leaks.
Hi, welcome everyone to Blackathon 2021. We are very excited to have you. Um, we've been working on this for the last five months um, in the midst of, um, you know, working and school and some of us doing both at the same time. So we're very excited to just um, share this experience with you. Um, and we hope this is as fun for you as it is for us. We're very, very excited for this event. It's finally coming to fruition. And um, yeah, so I'm Leela Hampton. Um, so right now I'm a graduate student at MIT in computer science. I focus on, um, you know, AI for social good and AI and ethics. And I am going to turn it over to Dave to introduce himself. Thank you, Leela. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We're really excited to have you guys. And, you know, we've been working on this project for a long time. And hopefully we want this to be an annual thing and it'll continue to grow and make a larger impact. My name is David Hill. Um, I am a full-time software engineer. Uh, recently, I just graduated from the University of Virginia with my systems, uh, Master's of Systems degree. And per before that, I uh, graduated from Howard University with my Bachelor's in Computer Science. Um, part of my background, I've worked at a lot of different Fortune 500 companies, and I'm really interested in tech for social good, um, especially as it relates to um, the most vulnerable communities. So that's just a little bit about me, and I really hope you guys enjoy the event. That was such an awesome intro, Dave. We also want to introduce our... Um, first of all, I would also like to say that we're actually all HBCU graduates. Um, Hamza and I graduated this year, and Dave, you graduated in 2019, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So Dave is Howard, I'm Spellman, and then Hamza's UDC, University of the District of Columbia. But yeah, we want to introduce Hamza. He can't be here right now because he's a working man, and so he'll be um, available later tonight um, at his office hours for the participants. But Hamza is an entrepreneur, coder, gamer, and fitness enthusiast. He's the founder of A Black Gen, a lifestyle clothing brand that encourages a positive and ambitious lifestyle. And he has also founded Snickwa Technologies, which works on mobile app and web develop development. And it's a consulting firm, and it's consulted with multiple individuals, startups, and public schools. Hamza has previously um, interned as a software engineer um, at Microsoft seven times, and he is now a full-time software engineer there. He has, um, oh yeah, he was also formerly a lead software engineer for Brax. He is an above and beyond CS software engineering fellow with Facebook, or he was in the past. He has served as a programming and game development teacher with STEM Excel. He's also published a lot of media. You can actually go look that up. He's published a lot. Um, and yeah, again, he's a University of District Columbia alumnus, um, and he served as the vice president of Nesby from 2019 to 2020. He was also a Microsoft student um, ambassador, and he received the Microsoft scholarship many times. And yeah, and you will get to meet him um, tomorrow and Sunday. Awesome, awesome. So Lila, what can we expect from, uh, from Black Abel? What can we expect from Blackathon? You can expect um, an awesome weekend full of talks from people who are experts on tech for social good and also just experts on critiquing tech, decolonizing tech, and all these other things. Um, and also just people who think a lot about, like, can we even decolonize tech and all these, um, you know, uh, all of these things. And we also have some people who specialize in thinking about artificial intelligence um, and what that means socially and around the globe, um, especially in the global south. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's going to be a fun weekend of talks. We wanted to add some talks to um, the hackathon. You can also expect to see some really cool um, projects from our hackathon participants. We're really excited for those. They will... Um, present on Sunday um, and yeah we're really excited for those and yeah awesome awesome and uh, one thing I want to talk about is a little bit about our history and our purpose like how we came to uh, creating Blackathon um, it was around it was like around December of last year and Leela called me and uh, you know she said that she had a really good idea or December I don't know if was you recall it? Way before, yeah, because remember in December we we were still we we were planning with Hamza. Oh, you're this right. You're right. Over. Right. 
Yeah, but we were having this conversation about like coming up with a event where we can culminate the greatest minds from the diaspora to come up with solutions to the pro biggest problems in our different communities around the world. So this is kind of how it culminated. Yeah, and we were also thinking about how a lot of times we don't get to engineer the technologies that we want for our communities. Sometimes um, certain people will engineer them for us and then tell us what we need in very much a savior complex type of way. So we just wanted to give people kind of agency to work on the problems that they think are important for their communities. And I really am excited because um, just talking to some of the participants and just seeing some of what they want to work on. And it's just very passionate people. It's going to be so great. I'm very excited um, to see what everybody works on because um, people have already um, pitched some like really great things. And so, yeah, it's, it's really nice just to see people take ownership and really say like, this is what I think would be like great for my community. And like, these are the things that I bring to the table and just like, yeah. And just seeing everybody's like, passion for um yeah this intersection between this interplay between um tech and social justice is very exciting definitely it definitely is and one thing i wanted to mention too um for the audience out there um over the course of the weekend so all of our uh events will be hosted on uh youtube live stream so the chat box is how you can interact with us so if you have any questions or have anything you want to say, just type it right in the chat box. We wanted to make Blackathon as accessible as possible for people in different countries, people that might not have the best internet connection and whatnot, um, just everybody. So um, if you want to connect with us, if you want to ask the speakers a question, um, we'll be moderating so I can see all your questions uh, when you put them through the chat box and we'll ask them for you. Awesome. And we also wanted to talk a little bit about how people could, about some things that we could have coming down the pipeline and the ways that we could, um, that people could support us. Um, well, first of all, do you want to go, Dave? Do you want to start or? Oh, uh, you can start. Yeah. Fine. Okay. Yeah. One way I would say support us is please, um, you can subscribe like right where you are now to actually our YouTube channel and we will actually have um, the talks are unlisted right now and um, exclusively for the people that signed up um, via Eventbrite, but later we will actually allow people to um, access these talks just in general from our YouTube page. And also, we're a nonprofit and we do need money to run. We need money to do things. We need money for prizes for our participants. We need money to um, pay for a website. We need money to pay for like um, custom email domains, all these things. Like it costs money to run a nonprofit. So um, that's a way that you can actually literally help us for free is by subscribing to our YouTube so that we can eventually get enough subscribers to um, you know, start generating income off of our YouTube. We do plan to keep putting content on our YouTube. Um, and yeah, and also you can sign up for our mailing list. Our mailing list will, um, you know, just keep you up to date about Blackathon because we plan to like run events throughout the year. We'll again, have more talks. We actually love um, the idea of just people coming and giving their expertise and having this um, way of thinking about, you know, engineering these technologies as a community together. So yeah, if you wanna, if you wanna um, join our mailing list and just see what we're up to and just keep up with these talks, I'll probably have some research talks coming down the pipeline on there as well. And we also, are thinking about starting a Patreon. Um, when we start the Patreon, I'll make sure to um, put all my research talks up there first. So it'll be just a definitely an exclusive thing. So some of the things that I'm thinking about right now are AI and public health for like black people and queer people and disabled people. Um, I'm also thinking about um, like carceral technology, so like predictive policing and things like that. So yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about a lot of things. So if you would like to just have like, I guess like exclusive access to that, exclusive first access to that, then you can um, feel free to sign up. We're trying to like um, just give people a lot of ways to interact with us and just like keep, um, I guess, giving educational content and interactive content and all that other things, but yeah. Definitely, definitely. Some of the talks that I'm, I'm planning on hosting too, 
are around uh, clean energy, technology for clean energy. Uh, I've done some research on that as recently as this past summer, um, figuring out ways to uh, get Virginia, state of Virginia, to be carbon neutral by 2030. So stuff like that. Uh, blockchain, cryptocurrency, I'm really into that too. So we'll be hosting speakers and I'll be speaking on topics like that. And I love talking about the impact that uh, technology will have on our community, especially communities of color. Because um, oftentimes when new things come out, either we're too, you know, the train leaves and we miss it or we're negatively impacted by it. So um, a lot of those topics are really important to talk about and discuss so that we can be aware of it and we can move forward. Yeah. Also, you know, you could talk about cloud computing, too. Oh, yeah, I do that. Too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, you can talk about cloud computing, too. But yeah, so we're going to have some really cool things coming down um, the pipeline. So, yeah, if you want to um, be involved and stay tuned, we would really appreciate that. And yeah. Oh, another way you guys can support us, too, is if you follow us on uh, Instagram. That's one of the platforms we're on now. I'll put that in the uh, YouTube chat so you guys can follow us. It's I, uh, at blackathon.tech. So if you guys follow us on there, that'd be great. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it for now. I guess so. Yeah. And also, um, feel free to come back at four for Ron's talk. We will probably start five minutes after the hour just to give everybody time to um, come through and just make sure that we're setting up and make sure everything is like okay on the back end because we do have to like run some stuff on the back end to be able to stream to YouTube. But yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we look forward to hosting you guys further and we hope you guys really enjoy Blackathon. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. See y'all. See you guys at four.
AKI Beats. Okay. Okay, beats.
来。
KI Beats. Okay, awesome. Hello, everybody. We're back with our opening keynote of the event, Dr. Ron Egglash, and we are very excited for his talk called Hacking as Afrofuturism, Black Traditions of the Bottom Up. And so we just want to do a quick introduction of Dr. Egglash. He holds a BS in cybernetics, an MS in systems engineering, and a PhD in the history of consciousness, all from the University of California. He worked as a software developer in Silicon Valley, a Fulbright Scholar in West and Central Africa, and a faculty member at RPI. He is now a professor in the School of Information at the University of Michigan, and he is known for his book, African Fractals, his anthology of appropriating technology, and his software suite, Culturally Situated Design Tools. Collaborating with indigenous artisans, makers, space collectives, urban growers, and others, his research program on generative justice develops systems that nurture the circulation of value in unalienated form, connecting schools and communities with decolonized forms of sustainable production. Everybody, welcome Dr. Ron Egglash. Thank you for that kind introduction. Let me get started here. All right, so there's three parts to this talk, decolonization and three easy steps. The first one um, is just asking, where does the science and technology of bottom-up organization come from? And the second part is, what is self-organization in these original Black traditions? And then the third part is, how might we apply those Black traditions of the bottom-up uh, to, to do just and sustainable future? Let me begin by saying what isn't bottom up, what is not self-organization. So when things are top down, they tend to produce these linear, very inflexible structures. Classic example is the military. And you've got our, our uh, army uh, base camp there as an example of the kind of structure it produces. So what is self-organization? When you have a bottom up process, it is non-linear, somewhat unpredictable and it's highly adaptive. So here you have some fish doing this beautiful uh, self-organization and a shark comes along and they scatter everywhere and then they reform. And now it's another uh, uh, organized structure. So you've got this beautiful ability uh, to be robust in the face of challenges of self-organization. There's lots of advantages to both. So uh, top down is good for something like the military or a corporation or a big church hierarchy. Um, and you can use it in design applications. So you can lay out a suburb as a grid. Um, you can design an automotive using a head engineer. You can design a computer chip uh, uh, using an electrical engineer. But bottom up is good for all sorts of things too. You know, our molecules self-assemble, species form, ecosystem self-repair. 
And I have here design applications with the little quote marks over it um, because nobody's actually doing the designing. There's no one designer, right? So that's things like crowdsourcing, uh, like, like uh, uh, free and open source software, uh, Wikipedia, artificial neural networks, uh, uh, nanotechnology. So all sorts of ways that we can apply self-organization uh, to high-tech systems. Nonetheless, it's top-down organization that's been the key to Western dominance, the key to the ability of the West to extract value. Um, and the classic example is uh, published in 1776 by Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations. He gives the example of the pin factory and how it's got this ordered sequence. You know, there's a CEO at the top that's organizing everything. And Charles Babbage cites Adam Smith when he invents the first mechanical computer. He says, just like Adam Smith's pin factory has a division of, of physical labor, we need this, this division of information labor, what he calls arithmetic operations uh, in order to create this difference engine, the, the, the first model of a general purpose computer. John von Neumann in 1945 develops uh, the von Neumann architecture, and that's basically the, the Babbage layout. And he clearly knew about uh, uh, Babbage if you look at, at some descriptions of, of him. Um, so it's basically the same architecture, right? You've got this top-down organization. You've got a central processing unit. It's centralized. And then you've got memory in whatever form the, the memory takes. And that works pretty darn good. So you look at von Neumann architecture, that's what laid out the, the basic architecture for Unix. And Unix became you know, Windows and, and uh, the Apple operating system and, and BSD. Pretty much every operating system that exists is based on the von Neumann architecture. So we can ask this question, if top-down is so terrific, why did we ever come up with anything else? Why did we bother switching things around? And one of these happened in the uh, 1980s. There was this failure of innovation. There was this economic bottleneck because of the pin factory model. And these two uh, uh, sociologists, economists, Piori and Sabel, uh, noted that in Northern Italy, there was no economic downturn. You'd have markets crash, the Italian government would fall, but Northern Italy would just prosper. And so they traveled there and interviewed folks and tried to figure out what was going on. And they discovered that there was what they called the second industrial revolution. So the first was mass production, but the second one was networked production. These are actually little, you know, even mom and pop size operations that were networked together. And just like I was showing you with when there'd be a, a threat, when the product they produced was no longer economically viable, they would just reassemble into something else. They had that bottom-up adaptivity. Um, that, was, that was one reason for, for switching over from top down, is it just seemed so much more robust to look at these uh, bottom-up networks. Um, but another one was the von Neumann bottleneck. So when you go out and buy a computer today, you've got to think, am I going to be using 32-bit software or 64-bit software? Well, that's a pretty tiny number, 32 bits, 64 bits. And if you look at the amount of memory you have, I mean, my laptop I'm using now, I've, I've got a terabyte of, of memory. 64 bits is like seven billionths of a gigabyte, right? So, so why is it that we're so messed up with our computers? We've got this enormous memory and this teeny tiny little bottleneck. It's because of the pin factory model. It's because of that top-down model. Um, so alternatives to the bottleneck in information technology arose too, but they weren't coming from Northern Italy. Um, one of the places was MIT in the architecture machine group run by Nicholas Negroponte. He's the one who you might recall did the one laptop per child project. And his group um, started with a book called Architecture Without Architects. Uh, and I quote here from Stuart Brand, um, the, the uh, architecture machine group was following that thread wherever it might lead. Books without authors, films without directors, a grander scale of research, something like a media laboratory seems worth attending. So the media lab at MIT comes out of this, a lot of inspiration for bottom-up machine architecture comes out of this. Um, and when you look at that book, Architecture Without Architects, what pops out at you 
are all these examples of African architecture, right? Um, now, you know, historians might contest that and say, well, I don't see why some obscure book should loom so large in the imagination of uh, MIT engineers. But there's no reason why Babbage's difference engine should loom large in the mind of von Neumann, right? That's the way we've written these histories. Um, it's just the case when indigenous knowledge is involved that it seems to get written out. Um, if you read Eric Raymond's manifesto uh, for open source written uh, in the uh, late 1990s, he's got a section called the hacker milieu as gift culture. And he says, and I quote, we can observe gift cultures in action among Aboriginal cultures living in ecozones with mild climates and abundant food. So he too is looking at indigenous models, right? You've got to get outside of the pin factory. You've got to get outside of this uh, Western colonial way of looking at things. Um, so he too is looking at, at indigenous culture. Um, and today the largest repository is Creative Commons. Um, and in fact, that references the commons, right? These, these indigenous uh, uh, common pasture, common uh, lake uh, being, being sourced by everyone. So that finishes uh, part one of my talk. Um, now to look at specifically this bottom-up tradition in, in Africa. So to recap, Western STEM, uh, science and technology, engineering, and mathematics, just spent 500 years optimizing for top-down extraction of value. And if you look at the greatest crises facing us today, these are all problems of extraction, whether it's extracting value from nature uh, in the case of pollution and overfishing and, and destruction of rainforest, extracting labor value from people, Right, so if you're if it's AI and you're training the AI to do what people used to do, you're essentially sucking up their labor value, and now AI owns it. Or extracting our social networks. So why is Mark Zuckerberg a, a billionaire? It's not that he did all that work; it's that our social networks did it. We did it, right? But he's able to vacuum up that value from these social networks. And it might seem well if we just removed capitalism from the picture, everything would be solved. But if you actually look at the history of the Soviet Union, um, you look at the situation of human rights for gays and lesbians in Cuba, um, you look at the food crises in Venezuela, um, the, the, the actual empirical history of communist countries just doesn't look that great. You still have massive amounts of wealth inequality, you have massive amounts of pollution. Um, and it's because you know when you ask what were Soviet engineers reading, <laughs> they were reading Babbage and von Neumann. They were reading exactly the same textbooks that folks in the West were reading, how to build extractive technologies, right? So no surprise that whether you extract value to private corporations or you extract value to the state, you end up with very similar sorts of problems. But that's not true for nature. Nature practices a circular economy. You know, you, when you learn the Krebs cycle in, in high school, when you learn how DNA produces other DNA, you're looking at a molecular circular economy. When you study how organisms are creating other organisms, you're looking at um, autopoiesis, at, at a circular economy of, of organisms. When you look at how collections of organisms in the ecosystem repair after a, a wildfire, you're looking at sympoesis, right? Many things together, repairing themselves and restructuring themselves. So wherever you look, you can see this power of recursion, the, the, the power of a system that can go back, pull back on itself. Um, and of course, uh, uh, physicists like Schrodinger um, come, come up with uh, terminology like a, a negative entropy, negentropy, right? Um, they're, they're quick to use nature as a model, not so quick to use African culture as a model. Why would that be? So one of the main extraction technologies was colonialism. If you can convince people that they, their civilizations are childlike and that your Western civilization is the, the only adult in the room, right? Um, then you can justify taking over their land. And in some cases, we've, we've managed to go post-colonial. We, we kicked out the colonizers. But in many ways, our minds are still colonized, right? Even if the land is, is not. And of course, in some cases, the land is still colonized. So elsewhere in human history, 
we haven't seen extractive economies. We've seen what I like to call generative economies, so economies in which value is not extracted, it's just circulated. And so it stays in this unalienated form. And one of my favorite places for that is the village of Intonso uh, in Ghana. And I've gone there, I've lost track of how many times, many, many times over the, uh, the years. And, and I just love my experiences there. Uh, you see uh, Gabriel Boache, uh, who I first met, gosh, 1994. Um, and he passed away just a couple of years ago. I was so sad about that. Um, his wife there uh, boiling a big pot of bark. Um, they strain the bark and the compost goes into either uh, farming for, for mushrooms or it goes into, uh, uh, in many villages, it would go into a sacred forest. Uh, this particular village there, I've got a picture of a monkey that's uh, Bwalbin Thema, uh, just to the north of Intonso. Um, and from those monkeys and the birds that fly into the sacred forest, they disperse that biodiversity elsewhere, including the places where the, the, the tree bark grows. This is the body tree. So it's this beautiful circular economy. No surprise that if you have a recursive economy, you're going to have recursive architecture. But we don't recognize that as a geometry, even though it's right in front of us, right? And I too, when I first saw these fractals in African villages, I wasn't thinking knowledge system. I was thinking, well, coral reefs are fractals, termite mounds are fractals, some kind of bottom up, you know, unconscious dynamic is going on here. Um, and it wasn't until I got there to Africa and started interviewing folks and asking them, okay, how do you do this, right? How do you put this thing together? That I started to realize, wow, they've got recipes, they've got algorithms. There, there's a method and a practice here. Um, and it's not just technical, it's deeply spiritual, it's deeply ecological, right? So they've embedded these recursive algorithms in a context that keeps things in this generative state, this unalienated state. So uh, recently we did a, a, a film with uh, uh, Samuel Jackson in Ethiopia, where we showed these um, recursive uh, crosses uh, in a church and you've got uh, the snake biting its own tail as symbolism. Uh, for these recursive systems, right? So, so beautiful uh, formation of this knowledge um, that extends, you know, in, in a kind of web-like way across many domains. I like to summarize this by thinking about it in terms of computational complexity. So when mathematicians measure the complexity of something, um, something that's highly ordered has a low complexity and something that's completely random has a low complexity. Things are, are considered highly complex when they are self-organized. That's why fractal structures are a good way of measuring complexity for mathematicians. And what they found is that that tends to, to um, conform along the kind of recursion that you've got. So highly ordered systems tend to have negative feedback. So they're damping perturbations, right? They're keeping things very regular. Highly disordered happen to have a lot of positive feedback. So things are, are constantly being disrupted. But the fractal systems are ones where you have both negative and positive feedback combined. So there's enough innovation and disruption to keep things interesting and enough negative feedback to keep it within bounds, right? Infinity in the palm of your hand, a fractal. And that's what's going on. That's why we don't recognize indigenous STEM when we see it, when it's right in front of us. Our, our lenses, our eyes, um, have become accustomed to judging technology based on how good it is at extraction. If you, if you judge technology on how good it is at generativity, then you would see that these are some of the most sophisticated technologies in the world, these indigenous technologies. All right, that ends part two, and now I'm on part three, the last part. So we can think about state societies as, you know, congratulations, pat on the back, you've got the most extractive technologies in the world, <laughs> a bully for you. Um, but these indigenous societies have the most generative. And so uh, if you think about the system of restorative justice, it's about uh, not getting revenge, but about putting the perpetrator and the victim together at the same table and trying to work together to come up with a restorative solution. So let's think about extractive and generative in those terms. How do we bring together the high tech with these indigenous frameworks? And to some extent, 
um, uh, after I wrote the African Fractals book, um, people just picked it up on their own and started dreaming up fantastic applications that I never would have thought of. So, uh, and Eddie Okafor has this beautiful book, Binti, um, where one of the characters uh, codes her family history and her cornrow braids. She discovers this artifact in Africa, that's a fractal artifact. And um, uh, uh, Erna uh, Broadbur has this beautiful uh, history of the Afro-Caribbean in terms of fractals. Uh, Okada uh, University design uh, uh, program has this black fractals program they've been doing. There's these uh, architectures in Ethiopia now that are using fractal geometry and so on. Um, but I did, I did want to make some effort to you know, put this stuff into practice. So one of the websites you can go to is csdt.org, Cultural Security Design Tools. Everything's free, everything's open source. Um, and we've made this mainly for K through 12. So kids can learn the heritage algorithms uh, from uh, indigenous history, um, including indigenous white history. So I don't want white kids being taught, the best we can do for you is teach, teach you to feel ashamed of yourself, right? That's gonna drive them right into the arms of the Proud Boys. Um, so we have material on that website um, for white kids to start thinking about, hmm, well, cult uh, Celtic tribes used to extend all the way across Europe, all the way from Ireland to Turkey. What happened to those Celtic tribes? They got taken over by the Roman army. They got taken over by colonial empires. The only difference is this is, you know, Europe eating itself, right? So it's cannibalized itself and it tells itself this other story about how, well, that was to everybody's benefit that the Roman army took over. Um, but if you think about it, uh, it's a perfectly good place to go back and find these indigenous traditions. Um, we have a section on the Appalachian region. So today that's Trump country, but back uh, before the Civil War, there was a thriving abolitionist movement in, among poor whites in the Appalachian region. And we just sort of stumbled across that because we were looking at um, quilting patterns and we thought that'd be cool for kids to do. Um, but looking at the Appalachian quilting patterns, you see the radical rose, the, the mark of the abolitionist movement. So it's quite extraordinary for um, all kids, you know, of, of any color to realize that you can rethink some of these histories in these interesting ways. Um, but mainly, you know, we're, we're doing outreach thinking that um, we'd like to see uh, uh, BIPOC, Black and Indigenous and, and other children of color uh, come to this and get a sense of ownership of STEM, right? That it's not just uh, uh, Europe that invented mathematical and computing ideas. That These are in all these different cultures. Cornrows are, are such a, a powerful and beautiful way to do that. Um, and of course we do, you know, our, our uh, uh, controlled studies and we try to make sure that what we're doing is statistically uh, valid. Um, but the, the uh, experience of the kids are super important. And so we've reached out um, to some of the local braiding shops to get uh, some of the adults involved. So, so typically you bring in, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson and you're hoping, well, now we'll have a bunch of black astrophysicists growing up in the classroom. Um, but a lot of kids say, well, you know, he's a genius, but that's not me, right? Um, but the, the little braiding shop down the street, um, that's me. That's a local person I know. My auntie is friends with her, whatever. Um, so we've been training braiders to use the software as well and bringing them to the classroom as STEM instructors. And it just gives you a completely different view. Um, one of the things we do with the cornrow designs is we have kids 3D printing them and then those uh, mannequin heads can go back into the braiding shop. And so you, now you're circulating value between schools and communities in this generative form, right? Um, and the braiders themselves, here's a couple of them from uh, New York, uh, the braiders themselves said, well, this is really cool. We wanna get more involved. So we said, great, you know, what, what science and technology uh, uh, do you guys use? And they said, well, we're always worried about pH because it destroys your hair if you don't have good pH balance. Um, so we have a whole section of our uh, CSDT website called PH Empowered that looks at the history of PH and, and local entrepreneurs that have created alternatives. We teach kids to build these little Arduino-based uh, PH sensors. They bring in uh, hair products from home, detergents from home. Uh, and one of them actually started her own company making an, an alternative with, with balanced uh, PH and organic sources. So really neat place to see that generative uh, cycle come into being. Um, so big picture, 
we want um, to recognize that everything that happens is going to happen in an extractive context. It's not like we're sitting on an island somewhere that's just isolated from everything. But we can think about how these things are networked together. There's going to be a commons, right? There's going to be some circulation that's open source software, people sharing recipes, uh, a community uh, sharing in their spiritual roots, whatever it is. Um, and there's going to be some extractive part of the economy, but there's going to be places where that can come together, where we can we can uh, amplify, we can leverage the creative commons, um, and actually produce economically viable forms that can that can survive that extractive economy and prosper. And so it's really about shrinking down the extractive side and growing the the generative side. You know, you look back at, at history and you can see these little experiments happening. So Czechoslovakia, 1968, had what's called the Prague Summer, Summer of Prague. Um, they decided that well, they're not gonna use the Soviet Union's model of communism. We're gonna have our own model. And we're gonna actually have the workers in the factory decide what products are made and what practices are produced and what the hours are. They're gonna take over the factory. Um, and that was this beautiful blossoming of a generative possibility happening under socialism, right? And it lasted for about six months until the Soviets got wind of it. And then Warsaw Pact tanks, you know, roll into Prague and just dismantle the whole thing. The same thing happened under capitalism at the same moment in time. So in 1968, General Electric decides we're going to experiment with worker self-management. They didn't roll in tanks. They just found out that there's so much empowerment of workers that it's threatening our sovereignty. So they did the same thing that the Soviet Union did, just with, you know, they bring in management, right? And they say, no more worker experiments. You can see that it's not just the left versus right that we pay so much attention to. Generative versus extractive is orthogonal to the right versus left spectrum. Whether you're in a socialist economy or whether you're in a capitalist economy, you, in both situations, you have to struggle to actually empower the grassroots. And that's where these technologies, I think, can really play an exciting role. Um, so we've been working with uh, Native American youth, uh, looking at techniques for that. This is an example from uh, West Africa with African artisans. Um, we have a website, africanfuturist.org, uh, where we've sent them a laser cutter. And so they're uh, uh, using laser cutting uh, from the, the simulations of Adinkra symbols, um, and then getting old school textile artisans. So, so you know, auntie and, and uh, grandma and everybody has a little sewing machine somewhere. Um, so you've got this intergenerational collaboration going on. And that's so important. You know, we've worked in places like the Navajo Nation, uh, anywhere where the older folks feel like the next generation is just abandoning all of our, our, our traditions. Uh, it's super important to bring in uh, elders and, and, and bring back that connection between young people and old. Um, Kwame Robinson is a graduate student in the School of Information uh, at University of Michigan, and he's been working on a, a problem we noticed in the marketplace in Ghana. Uh, tourists would come in and they wouldn't know the difference between handwoven kente cloth and machine made fakes from, from overseas. Um, and so he's been developing an artificial intelligence system that uh, uh, has successfully told the difference between handmade and factory fakes. Um, so we published that. We're hoping we can now shrink it down to something that can go into a cell phone um, and it can be used, you know, we're open sourcing everything. Uh, so presumably that could be used in the case of, of Navajo uh, uh, weavers dealing with fakes and, and uh, pashmina shawls and any, any place. Um, so building up, we, we envision a whole economy, an ecosystem of these little uh, uh, small scale operations. Um, this is an example in Detroit. We got a small grant to build an African futurist greenhouse uh, at the uh, uh, Dobbles uh, African uh, Bead Museum in Detroit. Uh, that's um, Kisa Johnson there, who's, who's been in charge of it. Um, and Kisa has also been looking at how that could become a node um, within a larger scale network. So looking at online sales of foodstuffs from urban agriculture in Detroit uh, to consumers within that same community. Uh, this is another project looking at GIS and identifying sustainable sources of materials. 
Um, there's our AfricanFuturist.org website where folks uh, can buy our, our little, uh, and I don't make any money off of this. This is just all, you know, hoping that we can help uh, uh, entrepreneurs establish themselves. Um, so, so people are welcome to go to that website. Um, and uh, just to recap everything. So yes, originally we had these beautiful uh, circular economies and we can certainly try to reestablish those through political means or policy means. Um, but I like to think that the technologies that are being developed can play a special role. And so uh, here at Blackathon, I'm hoping that folks will think about, you know, how we can use technology as a kind of prosthetic um, to restore a, a generative economy. That's all for me. Thank you. Wow, that was awesome. I am blown away. It was, there's, yeah, there's a lot to think about from your talk. Um, do you mind if we get like just right into questions? Because like I'm already, yeah. yeah. Right okay, so. Um, I guess I'll probably maybe like work backwards. So one of my questions from sort of the end of your talk, um, I really liked how you talked about this kind of um, intergenerational approach to um, generative justice. Um, and I think that's very important because um, I think one hallmark of white supremacy is, um, you know, kind of I suppose, um, and colonization in both of them at the same time, but this um, kind of um, irreverence for the elders, which is just not um, akin to any, um, a lot of other indigenous places, especially I guess for like um, Native Americans and also just like the whole African continent on the whole. And so I guess, um, yeah, I, I, I know you touched on it a little bit, but would you mind also maybe um, emphasizing the importance of thinking, like you said, about the intergenerational um, importance in that aspect? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, let me uh, go back to sharing if I might. Uh, and this is, if this will let me get out of there, um, we can go to our website here. So we, we recently did a, um, a little uh, a workshop for Brooklyn schools and, and um, we had 300 kids <laughs> in our, in our uh, elementary school group. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we had something that really connected with them. Um, and the, the, the software is blocks based software. So it's, you know, super easy stuff for, for little kids to just jump right into, right? So here I can make my little parade uh, and I can ask, well, what if I had, you know, 200 repeats instead of 20? Oh, that does something kind of cool. Um, you know, what if I scale down much slower? So I just do 99%, well, that's kind of cool. Right, so gradually the, 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 the kids just by trial and error can pick up on the um, software side of it. But we wanted to make sure that there was also a, a real uh, culture connection that we weren't just jumping to a kind of instrumental use as if the culture is, you know, the cheese and the kids are mice and we're trying to trick them to go into the STEM pipeline or something. Um, so typically folks do something like uh, hip hop for that purpose. And I started to realize, wow, you know, when I started doing it, um, I could just say hip hop and we all were sort of on the same page, but now we've got so many generations in between, even hip hop is losing a sense of, of intergenerational connection, right? Um, so, so we've got here some pictures where the, the, the kids can, you know, uh, I mean, they're little kids, they need to be interactive. They can't just be reading a bunch of text. Um, so we're playing around with things like that. Um, and then just to get them used to the idea that there's something about these simulations that makes sense, that connects. Um, we have a little game here where the kids can play, you know, match the uh, uh, star with the simulation. Um, so so uh, uh, trying to get at a sense of intergenerational connection, you know, can be done in lots of different ways. I, 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 <laughs> I guess is what I'm trying to get at. Um, I think for the, the case in West Africa, it was super important to have um, the laser cutter there because you have a generation that is eager to jump into digital fabrication and e eager to grab you know, uh, the emerging technologies. Um, but uh, being able to connect with the older generation was not only something we thought was uh, culturally and socially important, um, but it was actually key to the manufacturing 
success. So, so it, it, it really brought together, you know, uh, several different needs and several different uh, resources in this, uh, I, I hate to use an overused corporate word, but synergy, right? That, that the, 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 the whole is greater than the, than the parts. Um, there was a kind of synergy there bringing in the, the older skills and the younger skills together. Um, we often use the term artisanal cyborgs to talk about that, that it's, you know, part artificial, part natural, part old, part young. So a, a, a kind of cyborgian approach to these things is, is a, another way to think about it. Yeah, I really, yeah, I like that name. I thought it was really cute when I saw it on like the slide, but yeah. Um, and well, I also Donna, Donna, Donna Haraway was my dissertation advisor. She wrote the Cyborg Manifesto. Oh my God, are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's awesome. That's off to Donna. No, 100%. I, I love that book. Um, yeah. And so, um, oh, wait, I also wanted to touch on kind of like, actually, I will say that um, your work, um, because you actually have worked with um, one of my advisors from undergrad, I believe, Kenneth Gaucher, I believe you've worked with him or his mentor, Juan Gilbert. And um, so being able to see your work um, coming up and stuff like that, probably because now I'm interested in geometry, and I'm actually in a geometry class this semester, and just being able to see how it's indigenous to my um community and my ancestors and stuff like that so I thought it was interesting because um not only are African fractals a part of the geometry but there's just this whole thing in like a lot of African cultures and like regions about like like you said Adinkra um I know um writing in um this like white powder kind of um like writing symbols in white powder or something is very important in um, like Western African religions and some um, like Congo based, um, like older, like Bantu religions and stuff like that. And so just thinking about like, I like that you put that link in there about like spirituality and geometry too. Um, and yeah, so do you have like any insights on that? Like what's your take on that? Because you've been doing this for a while. So yeah, I would love to hear. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um... So, so let's, let's go back to Adinkra again. So you've got this uh, textile uh, 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 tradition, um, beautiful sets of, of symbols, right? Fantastic set of symbols. Um, and and uh, they're socially quite profound. So here you have uh, uh, two uh, crocodiles um, and they're, they're joined uh, by their stomach. So it's a two-headed crocodile um, and they're fighting with each other. So the saying that goes along with the symbol, every symbol is a saying that goes along with um, um, Futu Funafu, uh, the saying is, you know, why, why do they fight, right? If, if I feed you, I'm feeding myself. So it's this beautiful symbol of essentially what we mean by open source, by, by creative commons, by the fact that we can all have a gift economy in which everybody uh, 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 gives and everybody takes. Um, so every one of those symbols has a, a little story behind it like that. Um, <laughs> this is me at an embarrassingly young age and uh, Gabriel Boache showing the proper way to, to wear a dinkra. It's like a, uh, a toga. Um, and, and if you look at a dinkra, you can see it in the architecture. You know, we're using it in schools here. Uh, in Manhattan, there's an African burial ground and there was a dinkra on one of the coffin lids. Uh, uh, here in, in uh, upstate New York, uh, the gun buyback program uh, uses one of the Dinkra symbols, the knot of reconciliation. Um, but it's really about observing the geometry of nature and then adopting that into a structure and then abstracting that into the, into the geometry. So the soul washer's badge is referencing what happens when one drop of water goes into a pond and the ripples extend everywhere. So it's power in every direction, right? Um, and the same thing happens for spiritual power. So this is one of the sacred buildings. Um, and if you look at the door of the building, that's what you see. I asked one of the Adinkra manufacturers, what does that symbol mean? And he said, church. But he was obviously translated into English, right? In Sri, you would say the equivalent of, of the, sh the shrine, the, the animist uh, building. So, so it's the same idea, this spreading, uh, not of political power, but of spiritual power in all directions. One of the most profound examples of the geometry though, comes from these spirals. And you'll see these, these spirals over and over again. So Jenneman, the uh, two rams who butt heads, 
right? Uh, essentially means don't be a bully. Um, and you'll see uh, uh, a coco non. Um, it's it's the 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 hen does does uh, tread on her chicks, but she does not kill them. In in English, we say tough love, right? Same idea. Um, so all of these have you know this beautiful meaning as well as a reference in the natural world. Why use a logarithmic spiral to represent things in nature? Because of fractals, because of growth spirals, because of power laws, right? So they're getting at this geometric property of the natural world and how very different it is when we lay down the, our grid or our Euclidean geometry. And in fact, if you look at um, the history of the logarithmic spiral in the West, in Europe, it first gets introduced by Rene Descartes. Um, and Rene Descartes says, well, I've got this really cool spiral shape I want to describe but it's not really part of mathematics because you can't use a compass on a straight edge. You'd have to use like a jointed compass that's going around a sphere or something. So I'm gonna call this a mechanical curve, not a mathematical curve. And that stays in mathematics for about 200 years uh, until this uh, uh, Scottish mathematician, John Leslie writes the geometry of curved lines in 1813. And he says, oh, by the way, this is also pine cones and pineapples and sunflowers and seashells and all these things in nature have a logarithmic spiral. So, you know, Africa is, is literally ahead of the curve, right? <laughs> For about 200 years. But of course the, math, the history of mathematics books never write it that way. And, and, and still today, when I describe this to folks, they're, you know, oh yeah, whatever. They're just artists making things. But it's a pretty intense focus on these logarithmic curves that you see. It's quite striking when you see it uh, in the Adinkra symbols, right? Um, and there's, a, there's one Adinkra symbol I, I really love. Um, that's this symbol, Jiname. Uh, it, it means, literally, Jiname means accept God. Uh, the saying is no one except God has the power of life. Uh, the fist is the symbol of power, right? The old black salute. Um, but coming out of that fist is the symbol for life. They're not talking about one particular organism. They're saying, if you abstract across every organism, what is the fundamental geometry of living things? And the answer is the logarithmic curve. So they're getting it exactly right, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, that actually leads into like another question I have, which is, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about, um, wait, where's it on the paper? Oh, this like interplay between like nature and these fractals and geometry and stuff like that. Because I mean, if you think about it, um, like indigenous traditions in general, again, like whether you're thinking about like, um, like anywhere in the world really um, at this point, but especially I can't really um, speak for like Europe cause like I'm not as much, I guess, um, familiar with um how their history worked with it but I know definitely from what I've heard of other histories that um nature has just been very important and I've been reading up recently it was very important in Ifa in West Africa it's very important in just a lot of African traditional religions in general um definitely important in um Native American traditions like in whatever part of the Americas you want to think about it right because there was this tie to the land and like you know right nature is everything and we're in nature and so um coming to this talk about like you know decolonization and like you know geometry and like yeah and just returning to indigenous traditions and respecting that and um yeah so like what's your take on that so if you if you look at um uh if you look at indigenous traditions uh not with a colonial gaze uh uh but with with a, an effort to decolonize one of the first things you notice is they're radically different and, and so, uh, you know, we, we tend to hear uh, indigenous as if it's all sort of one homogeneous group, but they have very different ways of, of looking at these materials. Um, so in the, in the case of Africa, I was referring to the sacred forest and, and uh, this particular relationships, cursed relationships. Um, but that's not really the, the fundamental thing in uh, Native American uh, systems. So if you look at Native American systems, go to our um, uh, Latin American 
uh, we did a little project in uh, uh, on the Galapagos Islands uh, a while back, and so we were drawing on a lot of the Ecuadorian uh, systems. And you can see here, it's, uh, you can have this in uh, Portuguese or Spanish or, or English, which is a really nice uh, feature for this particular one. Um, so, so we're using a model called um, Woven Heaven Tangled Earth. And this comes from an anthropologist who spent basically her whole lifetime uh, in Latin America and, and wanted to sort of summarize what she had seen. And she said, you know, over and over again, you see this tendency for folks to describe um, what we call the Big Dipper, right? The four stars um, or the celestial, you know, the path of the sun, the path of the moon, right? Um, and in, in uh, Native American society, you often hear of the four winds, the four directions, uh, uh, the Navajo have four sacred mountains, the Shoshone have four sacred colors. Uh, if you ask uh, Native Americans in California how to count, they have a base four counting system, not a base five counting system. So you would count one, two, three, four, five. They count one, two, three, four. Isn't it obvious, right? We have a base four body. Of course, you would want to have a base four counting system. So that's the that's the woven heaven. That's the Cartesian coordinate system, right? Um, but that's in the heavens. Down here on Earth, you have trickster, you have coyote, you have raven, right? You have these these characters um, that are constantly throwing a crazy flood one year and a crazy drought the next year. And a, and, and a pest infection of insects this year and a pest infection of fungus next year. Trickster is throwing one thing after another at you. How are you gonna keep up with that variety? The only way to do it is if you trickster right back. And so you have this profound diversity, biodiversity of your foodstuffs. So if you look at the original tomato or the original corn, you know, the original corn is like this big. It's, if you go back 10,000 years, it's practically inedible. Um, and over uh, uh, hundreds of generations of Native Americans using this trickster framework, you get this incredible profound variety of, of corn, right? Um, so, so the only way to keep up with trickster throwing one trick after another at you is to do the same thing right back with this biocomplexity. So when, when uh, 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 European settlers arrive in the new world, they see a bounty they have never conceived of before, this incredible variety. You know, think, think about what Italian food is like, like spaghetti and, and, and pizza, and it all has tomato sauce on it, right? Tomato is not a European plant, that's a new world plant. Think about the potato in Ireland. Think about a... Uh, 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 Potato is not a European plant. That's a new world plant. Think about how these, these colonialists sailed around the world into malaria infested areas. How did they survive malaria? Because they had a South American plant that was, that was based on the Chichona bark. It was, it was quinine. And that's what they used to ward off malaria. So if you look at the profound impact of, of the, this Native American breeding, the trickster framework of breeding, it is just mind boggling. You've got rubber, well, you know, rubber revolutionized industry, right? That's a new world plant. That's not a European plant. You know, every sector you can imagine of that time period was impacted by this bounty. It wasn't, a, a, you know, the gold that was coming out of, of Central America and South America, although that was also stolen, um, but it was really the, the wealth of genetics that was coming out of these places. So from that lens, you know, Native American civilizations were far more advanced than the Europeans. They were practicing monotheism. So you get monoculture. You can get the one variety of corn that I can make the most money out of, right? Not this profound biodiversity coming out of the ground. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but. That's amazing, that's amazing. Now we do have some questions from the audience, if that's okay. If you Please, that. yeah. Yeah, okay, so the first question is from Kevin. Um, he says, are there ways to correct the huge focus on extraction that large tech companies have? I, I don't know if there's a way to do it for large tech companies. They, ha they have this enormous momentum. And, and every time I see them 
you know, trying to make amends or making a public apology or something, it, it always seems like so much backpedaling um, that, that I've largely given up on them. Although Google, if you're listening, you know, <laughs> you want to hand me a million dollars, I'm open to it. But I, 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 often, I often ask folks who are doing social justice work, you know, why have we become the party of no? Why is it every time I see a, a, a algorithmic justice or data justice, some group doing that kind of work, it's about telling people what they're doing wrong, as if that's going to stop the extractive process. That's just going to make it easier for them to do it. Um, so I, I think you know we we have to think carefully about um, how to become the party of yes. We we've got great examples of this. So if you look at the feminist movement, for example. They didn't call themselves the anti-sexist movement. They didn't call themselves the anti-patriarchy movement. They called themselves the feminist movement. It was, it, was, it was positive about female agency. And that didn't even go far enough. So in the 1970s, uh, early 1970s, you know, uh, NOW, which was run by Betty Friedan, um, decided that they were going to make it uh, 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 taboo to be a lesbian in the National Organization of Women. And, and Betty Friedan had all the uh, lesbians in uh, the New York chapter expelled. Um, and so shortly after that, everybody started showing up with these lavender scarves because Betty Friedan was calling them the lavender menace. You know, and if you look out over the audience, you see nothing but lavender scarves, you start to get the message. Um, so out of that came a movement called sex positive feminism. And I think we need to do the same thing with anti-racism. We can't just be anti, right? It can't just be the party of no. We can't just be saying, you know, Google, you're bad in using surveillance. We have to start talking about the positive things that we can do with, with AI, with, with uh, data science. Uh, so I think that's a big part of it. Whether or not something can be done with large corporations, I don't know. Um, but I'm certainly very optimistic about mom and pop. Right. If if we work with the grassroots and we, we think about how do we craft AI in a way that benefits grassroots groups, whether or not you know Google can benefit from it, I, I don't really care as long as the grassroots groups can can benefit of it and sort of hold their own. So I think that's a, a, a big key part of it. That's amazing. That's amazing. Now we do have another question from Michael in the audience who says he's quoted, I think he's quoting you, he says at every scale, the power of life is due to self-generation. African traditions also use this recursive loop of circulating value. Can you develop your thoughts concerning this? Uh, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm more or less gave a, just gave a talk on that, but but uh, <laughs> I thought, you know, uh, but yeah, yeah, no, I I, 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 I get it. It's 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 confusing. So, so um, I'm, I'm uh, very impressed by Karl Marx when he was young. So when he was young, you know, he had this sense of unalienated labor. He said, you look at a craftsperson, they love their work. And they don't really care how much money they're making out of it because so much of themselves goes into that object, right? And they probably know the people they're selling it to. So I've got some moccasins that I'm making and I'm trading ears of corn for that moccasin. And I know how long it takes you to make 10 ears of corn. And, you know how long it takes me to make this moccasin, and so that's a fair trade. But if I go into a parking lot today, and I'm a worker, and I look over at my boss's Ferrari, and I notice you know, he's stuffing 10,000 ears of corn into the trunk of his car, I would know something's up. I'll never see that, because money makes that invisible. right? Money is the smoke screen that disguises unfair distributions of wealth. And so, so Marx very wisely said, that's a huge part of the problem right there, is we don't see the injustice. Um, but he came up with a terrible solution. He said, all we need to do is to keep using capitalism. He was really big on extractive forms of technology. And he said, just turn over all the value to the state, and then it'll be like Santa Claus. You know, it'll, it'll, it'll redistribute all the wealth to the good little girls and boys. Um, and that just doesn't happen. So if you look, for example, at phosphorus in the Soviet Union, you know, they used the most extractive technologies they could find on the farms because they wanted mass, you know, let's, let's build the world's largest mass produced farm. Um, and then it drains the soil of all the nutrients. 
And so they tried to put the nutrients back in using phosphorus. And at one point, the Soviet Union had like 50% of the phosphorus uh, usage in the world was all in one country because they were destroying the soil so quickly. Um, but if you look at traditional methods, organic farming, right, it never alienates value from the soil. You've always got that organic matter composting and making a little ecosystem inside the soil. So when I give a lecture to scientists, I often start with that. And I say, you know, surely you guys can use your, your scientific lens to understand the difference between alienating value in the soil and allowing value to circulate through organic farming, right? We can do the same thing with labor value. We can do the same thing with social value. It's, it's no different than it is with ecological value. It's just talking about different forms. Thank you so much. Thank you for that answer. That was amazing. So if, if uh, the audience wants to learn more about your research, connect with you further, how could they do that? Um, so if you do a Google search for my last name, it's, it's pretty unique. Um, and so that's likely to come up on our csdt.org website or our africanfuturist.org website or the generative justice website. Those are, are great places to start. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you so much for coming. This is like a really great talk. And I think, again, we, we wanted this to be the opening keynote because it's really a great way to like just start the hackathon and have people thinking about like, you know, like you said, like these generative technologies and thinking about how to put stuff back into the community and back into the earth and back into nature and, you know, back into ourselves. And yeah. So, yes, thank you again. We do. We really do appreciate it. it was a, um, I, I, I was thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Aww. All right. OK, let me stop recording. Looking at it.